Five Kids 1995 is pretty much in its own category. For the questionably voyeuristic child sex genre is, thankfully, a limited business, and mostly limited to the films of Larry Clark, see also Bully 2001, Ken Park 2002 and What's Up Rockers 2005. It doesn't help that, with kids, a day in the life of teenage New York skaters, dossers, drinkers, stoners and shaggers, Clark shoots his subjects via a documentary style that borders on creepy cinematic stalking, where every lifted limb is captured, every naked profile, every panty flash noted. Neither is the subject matter going to win him any friends kids got a commercially damaging NC-17 rating, no children under 17 on release, especially when the film opens with odious 17-year-old protagonist Telly Leo Fitzpatrick, a self-described virgin surgeon, deflowering a doe-eyed 12-year-old girl, and closes with Telly's teen buddy Casper Justin Pierce, raping stoned acquaintance Jenny Chloe Seveny, in her sleep. And yet, it's hard to dismiss kids. And there's certainly a sense that the cinematic world is a more complex and intellectually rigorous place because of its existence. Listen, for instance, to Clark himself questioning the validity of the film's NC-17 rating. Maybe it's because kids is not some fantasy bullshit. And every fucking movie now, has this sex scene in it, you know the guy's laying on his back and the girl's wiggling on top of him, he's got her breasts, and it's the stylized fake shit. But they're not NC-17. I just saw that movie Clueless 1995. Everything in that movie is in my film. It's about a teenage girl who's looking to lose her virginity. There's pot smoking and drinking, and a scene where she walks out of a party and she's stepping over bodies and people are throwing up in the swimming pool. It's a lot of the same stuff that's in kids, but it's done in the stupidest way, and everyone just finds it so fucking funny because it's so cute. Nobody puts that movie up to the standards that they're putting me up to. People say they find kids depressing. I find something as fake as clueless depressing. And the man, as they say, has a point. For Casino Royale 2006 Stay With Me. Yes, Casino Royale. Think about it. The greatest sublimated sex scene in film history. Better than the train into the tunnel in North by Northwest 1959. Better than the chess game in the Thomas Crown Affair 1968. Instead, it's Bond Daniel Craig, barely conscious and dragged into the rusty bowels of a moored torture tanker. Naked and bound 007 is rammed into a seatless chair, forcing his balls to poke through. Le Schiffer Mads Mikkelsen, a terrorist financier desperate to recover his cash, repeatedly thwacks Bond's bollocks with a pendulous rope while gurgling sweet nothings. Wow you've taken good care of your body and yes, we've been here before. Goldfinger Gert Frobe had certainly put some thought into laser-beaming the crotch of Bond Sean Connery in 1964. But this is different. It is making explicit all that was implicit, all those years, in the Bond legend. All that baba betting, the defining antagonistic relationships with male villains versus the trifling female flings. Here it is, finally, in Casino Royale. It is homoerotica writ large. And some torture scene that would NT be out of place in Fifty Shades. Control and submission. Le Schiffer gets his man. And Bond gets his rocks almost literally whacked off. Ultimately, the scene worked so well, in opening up the gay world of Bond, that it was revisited in Skyfall 2012, when Bond is tied to a chair once more by enemy Raul Silva Javier Bardem, Hooper's, first time for everything. To which Bond smirks and replies, what makes you think this? Is my first time Silva gasps, oh, Mr. Bond quite, 3 Team America World Police 2004 Sex is Funny. We know this. Everyone who's ever done it knows this. Everyone who's ever said something really fucking stupid while they were fucking and then burst out laughing afterwards knows this. Movies, however not so well clued in. And the worst of them, and the ones that fall flattest on their faces, are the ones that box out completely even the tiniest possibility of humor. Sharon Stone and Billy Baldwin, ramming themselves repeatedly and energetically against a concrete pillar in Sliver is one of them they're physiologically nowhere near coitus, unless his penis is penetrating her, through her black dress, somewhere above the fifth lumbar vertebrae. Most of Basic Instinct is another Have You Ever Fucked on Cocaine? Nick No, it's mostly Ale and Kebabs, Shazer, and all of Showgirls 1995. And no, contrary to received critical wisdom, Showgirls was never meant to be funny, camp or kitsch. Director Paul Verhoeven has always claimed it was intended to be, and still is, a beautifully shot and elegant movie. So, thank God for Team America World Police. The puppet-based action blockbuster arrived just in time, in 2004, when the movie world was still debating the issues of extreme sex in Irreversible, Real Sex in Nine Songs and Oscar-winning Sex in Monsters Ball. Team America shat on that. 
Literally the uncut centerpiece sex scene includes an extreme act of scatological humor. And you always knew that a sex scene was going to be special if it began with the lines, the gorillas beat him to death before the zookeepers could gas them all. My acting got my brother killed, and I have to live with that every day. The actor is Gary Director Parker, and the lover is a psychologist Lisa Kristen Miller. The sex scene that follows is 70 screen seconds of unadulterated, heartwarming lunacy that makes the possibility of future straight-faced sex scenes very tricky indeed. For it's all there. The fingers down the six-pack, the profile copulation with open windows and billowing curtains. The hair rock soundtrack and Aerosmith knockoff called Only a Woman and the increasingly ridiculous and giggle-inducing positions more so, obviously, because of the puppet protagonists. It's perhaps no coincidence the slick Hollywood sex scene almost entirely disappeared after Team America, and that within two years the populist comedies that emerged from Tinseltown were the comedies of bromance The 40-Year-Old Virgin, Knocked Up, Superbad etc. all films that established as their fundamental subject the inherent humor of sex and sexual desire, to shame 2011 shame is the moment when everything collides. The art house, the sum flick, the Oscar-worthy sex scene, the mainstream marketing hype. It's all there in shame, a dark and grimly compelling tale of one month's increasingly insatiable appetite for both sexual fulfillment and emotional annihilation. And yes, as directed by Steve McQueen and performed by Michael Fassbender, the movie is conspicuously low on laughter. And there is, undoubtedly, a flip-side shame that lives in an alternate movie universe, and it's called The Shagger, and features the exact same characters, plot and location, but is shot mostly in daylight, with K.T. Tunstall playing on the soundtrack, and starring Ben Stiller. And it's pretty funny. But shame is more than that. It's a somber, serious film that reaches and reaches for greatness, and tries, and hopes, to speak about the dominant and oppressive sexualization of the culture we live in today. It pitches Fassbender's antihero, Brandon, through a series of contemporary sexual scenarios, from the benign internet porn to the slightly, well, eccentric fetishistic gay bar followed by a threesome with prostitutes, and watches him crumble to nothing when faced with the seemingly simplest of sexual tasks, namely, to experience a physical encounter with a woman he likes, and indeed might love. Tragic. It helped too, for the hype around shame the film was given the dreaded NC-17 rating, which it didnt challenge and instead celebrated that star Fassbender was perceived at the time and possibly still is as something of a man about town. An absence of long-term relationships in his past, plus a string of ex-girlfriends, plus a legal barring order from one of them actress Sonu and Andrews, all pointed surely towards Brandon-esque tendencies in this white-hot star. I asked him about this when I met him, about the interplay between Brandon and Fassbender, and this is what he said. People don't know me, but when you don't have some socially acceptable normative behavior, where you're not married at a certain point in your life, people are always going to fill in the blanks. Was Brandon a performance that was relating to me, or cathartic to me? It's like, whatever I brought my contribution to it, Steve did his thing, everyone involved did their bit. It's out of my hands from then on in. I know what my personal life is, and thank God I'm not going through the imprisonment that is Brandon's life, won the outlaw 1943 because it had to start somewhere. And no, I'm not talking about flashing thighs in Busby Berkeley numbers, or Claudette Colbert's Luggin It Happened One Night 1934 or Fay Ray Almost Topless and King Kong 1933. Instead, The Outlaw is the movie, more than any other, where the decadent and often leery subtext of Hollywood product What is King Kong, other than an interracial sex fantasy comes spilling out over the surface, and encapsulates the entire project. The basic instinct of its day, the shame, this movie, under the fetishistic gaze of millionaire director Hughes, pretended to be about Billy the Kid Jack Butel, a miserable actor and Doc Holliday Walter Houston, bored, but was really about the misadventures of feisty sidekick Rio McDonald Jane Russell. The latter, then a young starlet known only for her impressive M on point, was the focus of everything about the movie, from breast-obsessed camera shots, to the marketing campaign itself. What are the two reasons for Jane Russell's rise to stardom screamed the film's smutty, and frankly naff, tagline. For its sins, the movie, which finished shooting in 1941, remained in distribution limbo for five years, bouncing from film company to censors scissors, to public decency campaign, back to film company, to brief 1943 release, to limbo again, and eventually becoming a smash hit in 1946.
Ultimately, the outlaw's raison d'etre, as no doubt Howard Hughes would have told you, is the depiction of Russell, who appears after 21 minutes of screen time, covered to the neck in a modest black top, and will spend each successive appearance on camera in lower and lower cut tops, in more and more lascivious poses, until finally, gagged and bound at a desert watering hole, she is splayed entirely, passively, for the male audience's delectation, arms aloft and body beautifully lit by one of the greatest cinematographers the medium has known, Greg Toland Citizen Kane 1941, the Grapes of Wrath 1940 etc etc. For the outlaw, in its chromosomal essence, is the first time a complete film said nothing at all to the watching, leering, male audience, other than, fuck me the rest is history.